you have too much protein in a single meal, your body isn't just gonna burn it off. That's what this study suggests. Welcome back, serious academic sports science doctor Milo Wolf here, and today we're talking about protein and why having too much protein in a single meal may not really be a thing. It's often been suggested that if you have too much protein in a single meal, your body will just burn off the additional protein or oxidize it, as we would call it. However, the truth is that until now, studies hadn't actually looked at consuming more than about 40 grams of protein in a single meal after a session. Additionally, studies until now had only looked up until about six hours after a session and a meal, not any longer than that. These studies have suggested that much above 20 to 40 grams of protein after a session, closer to 40 grams after a full body session, you don't really see any additional muscle protein synthesis. In other words, you don't see any additional benefit for your muscle growth if you consume more than about 40 grams of protein after a session. However, like I just outlined, these studies had some limitations, and that's where this study comes in. Indeed, the assumption that you can only benefit from about 40 grams of protein at once after a session, and that you don't see any benefit past six hours, doesn't seem to be true with other animals. Now, I'm not claiming that these animals are just like humans, because they're not. However, for example, in snakes, they will infrequently consume a huge meal about 20 to 25% of their body weight, and they will see elevations in muscle protein synthesis lasting at least 10 days. And indeed, of the protein in these meals, often as little as 5% is used as oxidation or simply burnt off. Now this study used something cool and new that is called a quadruple isotope tracer. Using this cool new technology alongside frequent plasma sampling and even muscle tissue sampling using biopsies, never look up what those actually look like in practice, they were able to track various parameters of protein metabolism over 12 hours after consuming protein. Without further ado, here's exactly what they did. First, on the day before participants came into the lab for testing, they had standardized meals and they finished eating by 10 p.m. so that the meals they had before the testing day wouldn't impact the results on the day of testing. Then, at 7.45 a.m., they arrived in the lab. The researchers took a variety of blood samples and muscle samples throughout the day. The main thing here is that they first trained, performed a regular lifting session, followed by consuming either 0, 25, or 100 grams of protein. Blood samples were taken two and a half hours, an hour before training, immediately after training, half an hour after training, an hour after training, and then every hour for 12 hours following training. Muscle biopsies were also taken immediately after training, four hours after training, eight hours after training, and 12 hours after training to really track protein metabolism. Using the isotope tracer technology used in the study, they were able to tell how much of the protein you ingested then ended up doing various things across your body. An isotope tracer you can kind of visualize as a protein that has attached to it a little tag that you can see so that you can tell where the protein that you ingested ended up going to. So the researchers looked at things from a plasma within your blood perspective, from a tissue enrichment perspective, aka to which tissues do the proteins actually go, and finally to a postprandial muscle protein synthesis perspective, aka muscle protein synthesis after you just ate. Now there are a lot of findings, so let me break them down for you one by one. As you would expect, when consuming 100 grams of protein, far more amino acids surfaced in the bloodstream, aka in the plasma, with 100 grams of protein versus 25 grams of protein. The important thing here, and this goes contrary to much of the popular advice in the fitness industry, is that there wasn't really a strong correlation between the amount of protein consumed and oxidation rates within your body. In other words, whether you consume 25 grams of protein or 100 grams of protein didn't impact oxidation rates or how much protein your body burnt off very much. Instead, this additional protein was used to stimulate protein synthesis in various tissues within your body. This was evidenced by an exceedingly high correlation between net protein balance and protein intake and a relatively weak correlation between protein intake and oxidation. Mixed muscle, myofibrillar, and connective protein tissue enrichment were all greater at 4 to 8 hours after consuming protein and 12 hours as well when consuming 100 grams of protein versus 25 grams of protein. In this case, enrichment just essentially means taking those proteins and adding them into your tissue. Now, you may not care about connective tissue protein enrichment or even synthesis. However, when it comes to myofibrillar protein synthesis, which is synthesizing proteins within your myofibril, the active unit within your muscle, essentially the muscle fiber, the researchers observed greater synthesis in the 100 gram group 
by 20% in the 0 to 4 hour time frame, and by 40% in the 4 to 12 hour time frame. Interestingly, muscle protein signaling and muscle gene expression didn't follow these same timelines. In fact, most of them ended far earlier than muscle protein synthesis or myofibrillar protein synthesis did in this case, suggesting that you shouldn't just use one as a proxy for the other. Interestingly, as far as the release of amino acids from your intestine into your bloodstream, this plateaued relatively early when you consumed 25 grams of protein. However, when you consumed 100 grams of protein, that release hadn't even ended by the time the 12 hours were up, suggesting that with large doses of protein, the amount of time your body needs to take those amino acids from your food and even release them into the bloodstream, let alone have them reach your muscle and other tissues, takes a while. As a fun fact, only some fraction of the protein that you ingest even ends up being in your bloodstream. In the case of the 100 gram protein group in this case, we're talking about 53% of that protein eventually ending up in the plasma over 12 hours. Going further than that, less protein yet gets enriched into your actual muscle tissue. In this case, over 12 hours in the 100 gram group, only 13 grams got enriched into muscle tissue. This disparity between how much protein shows up in your bloodstream and how much protein actually gets used within your skeletal muscle tissue has to do with the fact that your protein can be used up, for example, by plasma proteins within your bloodstream. One of the conclusions from this paper was that when you're consuming a large amount of protein, such as 100 grams, it may just take your body over 12 hours to fully digest that protein, have it go into your bloodstream, and then have it enrich your muscle, and then in turn, potentially, turn on myofibrillar protein synthesis. If it takes over 12 hours, you might see how this relates to, for example, your dinner. And indeed, the idea that a lot of the protein that you ingest above a certain amount per meal just gets burnt or oxidized doesn't seem to be true, with the author stating that at least 85% of ingested protein in the 100 gram group ended up getting used up for protein synthesis in various tissues across the body. Now, as a quick caveat to the findings within the study, I need to mention that the protein that they gave subjects here was milk protein, which, being composed 80% of casein and 20% of whey, is going to be relatively slow digesting. However, it doesn't seem likely that this influenced the results too much, because oxidation rates for protein remain low nevertheless, even if it wasn't slow digesting. As a fun fact, the reason the authors picked 100 grams of protein is because that's what they deemed to be the sort of practical upper limit for making a protein shake with. Because if you can imagine making a protein shake with four scoops, it's gonna be thick, it's gonna be sludgy, you hear me? So even up to 100 grams of protein per meal may not be such a bad idea, and it may not just result in oxidation of the additional protein. Your body might still use it for muscle protein synthesis, but just over a long time course after that feeding. Now, before you go off and say that this study proved that fasting was optimal for growth, let me give you a few caveats to what the study did and didn't show. First, while the study measured various markers of protein metabolism, like muscle protein synthesis, etc., none of these are actual muscle growth. And indeed, this was an acute study. When you look at the correlation between muscle protein synthesis and actual muscle growth, it is not a perfect correlation. And so, just because they found certain things within the study doesn't mean it will perfectly translate to muscle growth as well over the long term, as opposed to just in one specific feeding. And the final limitation is that this study was exclusively performed in younger physically active men. As you get older, and as you're less physically active, you generally grow more resistant to anabolism. So if anything, with more sedentary and older participants, maybe the response would have been different. Maybe they would have seen even more of a benefit from having a high protein dose all at once versus a low protein dose. Now that I've broken down the study, let me give you a few takeaways. First, just because you have more than 40 grams of protein in a meal after a session, doesn't mean you're just gonna piss out that protein or just burn it off. Even if you can only have one or two meals per day, still try to get your daily protein in. Just because you're exceeding 40 or 50 grams of protein per meal doesn't mean that additional protein is useless, as it seems like for at least 12 hours sometimes, that protein will be used for protein synthesis. Fasting may not also be quite as detrimental to muscle growth as we once thought. However, it is still unlikely to be ideal, and this study ultimately doesn't look at muscle growth directly, but rather is an acute study of various markers of protein metabolism. Additionally, it seems like connective tissue does in fact respond to protein, and I'm not sure what this means exactly, but at least it's good to know. A big protein feeding can stimulate myofibrillar protein synthesis even 12 or more hours later, and so this might have applicability to your meal before you go to sleep, for example. Based on this research, it may be worth having a relatively large protein feeding as close to bedtime as possible. I would consider having anywhere between 40 and 100 grams of protein at once, as close as possible to your bedtime to stimulate this effect. With that being said, don't think that because you want to have a big feeding of protein before sleep, potentially, that your protein intake should shoot all the way up to 300 plus grams. 
your daily protein intake should still likely be around 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. Just make sure that some of that protein is backloaded towards the end of your day, right before you go to sleep. And because daily protein intake being sufficient, by and large, is the main thing, don't worry too much if you're unable to optimize things right before you go to sleep. Finally, if you're looking to optimize your muscle growth, it is likely still prudent to have at least three meals per day with protein in it to maximize muscle growth. Anyways, that's the video. Your friendly neighborhood doctor broke down protein yet again. What can't he do? If you enjoyed the video, please do consider commenting, liking, subscribing. If there's anything you would want to see in a future video, let me know down below and I'll see you guys, my subscribers, in that next one. Peace.